Um, I'm going to try to sum up in a short amount of time uh, a 20 year struggle um, that wasn't easy. There was there was law and um, science and advocacy and time that came together to get the ban on chlorpyrifos first in California and some other states and then federally in the US. Um, I'm answering three questions that Fernando sent to me. First, each one at the top. First, evident, the evidence of chlorpyrifos health and environmental damage, especially neurological disorders in children. There was a lot of epidemiology that grew over time. Uh, so we had epidemiology first from uh, children that were born in urban housing, like New York City uh, in Harlem, who had very high levels of exposure, maybe public housing, uh, more for um, poor, poor um, people. And there was a lot of uh, cockroaches and, and you know insects and pests. Uh, so there was a lot of spraying inside the apartments and inside the homes of high levels of chlorpyrifos. Pregnant women were exposed, the babies were born, and that we know what the exposures were from at least one sample that was taken uh, when the uh, babies were born. Uh, and uh, so they know what their, at least one prenatal exposure. From that, we know that prenatal exposures, exposures during birth, are most associated with neurological deficits or um, poor outcomes later. Uh, we know that it's in IQ and learning, there's uh, behavioral problems and altered social development. The important thing about these epidemiology studies is what they showed was that th th those things happened even when the levels of exposure were so low that in the pregnant women, there was no indication of um, inhibition of cholinesterase or so no, no, no markers for chlorpyrifos exposure in the pregnant women. But even then at those low levels, they were seeing effects in the children. That epidemiology came out over years one of the game-changing studies uh, is this 2013 review by authors from Chile. Uh, they reviewed 27 studies and only one of them didn't show an effect. So they showed an overwhelming um, uh, agreement across different kinds of studies, including of farm workers and their children, as well as urban uh, housing or city housing of these very similar effects in the children born when they were exposed uh, early uh, it, it prenatally, so during pregnancy. That was the strongest um, indication of future harm. But some of the effects were altered reflexes, um, motor delays, so um, as well as IQ and learning um, problems. There was also uh, a decrease in working memory. So the ability to really have the kind of memory that helps you function in life and get through school. These kids were followed from birth over time. And they researchers, every time they followed up, they kept seeing effects in these kids. So it seems to be long lasting, maybe a lifetime. Um, and some of the effects look like what we see with uh, attention deficit or hyperactive disorder and also effects like on autism spectrum disorder. Importantly, rodent studies in the laboratory where you had really controlled exposures, you knew exactly what the animal was exposed to at exactly when during pregnancy, and then they followed those rat pups out, had very similar um, outcomes very similar neurological problems with the epidemiology. So very good concordance between laboratory and epidemiology studies. But of course, these studies take place over a couple of decades and epidemiology is such a terrible way to understand the harms of a chemical because you're talking about impacts in real people in the population. The California ban in 2019 it was effective in 2021, 
relied on the rodent studies, not the epidemiology. And critically, they relied on two studies from Spanish authors and one from Brazil that in rodent studies were able to show the same kinds of effects that we were seeing in the epidemiology, again, from pre-birth exposures, so prenatal exposures. Um, and importantly, in these studies, they showed that the, the effects were in, in the pups at levels too low to elicit effect in the adult or the pregnant rat. So the, the pups, the juveniles were getting effects so low, they couldn't detect exposure in the adults. Um, because um, California um, compelled Dow AgroScience into voluntarily withdrawing its product. They agreed not to register it. It was really important in the US because one quarter of the total use of chlorpyrifos was in California. And a lot of that use was in uh, areas that were near farm, uh, near homes and schools where pregnant women and children could be exposed. What was critical to getting this was not only the science, those important rodent studies, and the epidemiology that showed concordance, but also advocacy. And in that advocacy coalition included farm workers and farm worker unions, but also teachers unions, school staff, nurses unions, and others that um, not only represented workers and exposed populations, but also health and healthcare. And that was critical. Uh, and, and environmental groups like mine. Um, that was that solidarity across those groups was critical um, to getting the ban in California and the California ban was critical to getting a ban in the US. The other thing that California did is they developed this chlorpyrifos alternatives working group. And they came, so that helped farmers and, and other users of chlorpyrifos to I understand how they were going to transition away from chlorpyrifos. Um, I laugh because uh, in lots of cases, you don't need anything at all. And that was one of the things that people tried to get into this report is not just a chemical or a pesticide alternative, but using more non-chemical farming practices uh, that are truly safer practices. Um, and we had time to do that. This was a, a several year process. There was members of the public, farm worker advocates were on this group, science, many different scientists. So it was very productive. Um, federally, what happened then is in August, 2021, EPA revoked the food tolerances. This means that EPA says you can't have any residue of the chemical on food. So that effectively, with no residue allowed, it meant that you couldn't um, use it on any food crops. You couldn't use it anywhere where it'll get into the water and contaminate food crops. And it can't be used in any other country that wants to sell those foods to the U.S. So it has impacts globally. Um, it was the result of 15 years of litigation, 20 years of advocacy, and 30 years of science. Uh, it didn't come quick. Um, PAN North America Pesticide Action Network was critical with us in filing the first petition. And Earth Justice uh, did the litigation. One thing I'll point out is that because it was a food tolerant revocation, it's still allowed in nurseries and greenhouses, floriculture, golf courses, trees, Christmas trees, um, a lot of places where workers uh, are still exposed, including uh, women who work in these greenhouses and nurseries, including women of reproductive age. So we're still trying to get those last uses banned. This is the, Fernando asked the question, what are some of the limitations of risk assessment? And I, I really had to laugh because in 20 plus years of doing this job, I mean, there are so many limitations. I don't, I don't need to tell this audience, but I thought the best way to sum up what's wrong with risk assessment is this timeline. This is a timeline of how long industry and political pressure could delay the obvious, delay the um, banning a chemical that science was repeatedly, repeatedly showing 
in scientific studies was too dangerous to be used, that there was no safe level for pregnant women and prenatally exposed children. And nonetheless, this process is a 20 year process with at least five times in court, many, many studies, including three epidemiology studies in, in uh, children grown up to the age of about 10 or 12, um, which is so sad. I mean, it's so sad to um, have to have studies like that in people. So, um, oh, and the other thing I'll point out is when, when the EPA finally proposed the ban, it was on November 10th. Uh, whoop, sorry, I'm going to go back. Uh, which was after the U.S. election, but before the inauguration of President Trump. So they, they EPA waited to make this proposal till it's till the Obama administration had no more time. They were out of time to do so after eight years of the Obama administration. So this is what's wrong with risk assessment. Um, and um, this is my last slide in this short presentation. It's from a fantastic report by Earth Justice that uh, came out last year. And what it says is that we the, we got chlorpyrifos mostly off the market, mostly banned, but there's the rest of the organophosphate pesticides and EPA is already said they were supposed to finalize those evaluations this last month, October last month month. They've already said they're going to miss the deadline. Some of those, some of the pesticides, they're going to miss it by several years. Uh, it, it, technically, we can't sue them until they finalize those, but we will uh, sue them almost surely. Um, Earth Justice is doing the lawsuits uh, with representing PANA, uh, PANA Set Action Network and NRDC and others. Um, and this is a, a table of all the different harm of all the different organic pesticides that EPA has already found. They've already found all these different effects, not just neurological, but reproductive toxicity, some cancer, immune toxicity, and endocrine disruption. And it's still used on all of these common crops that kids eat. And They've already, EPA has already determined that many uses are too unsafe, and yet they haven't done anything about it. So one of the things we're trying to do now with Earth Justice is ask EPA to at least cancel the uses it already has determined is too safe. Um, so all of this is what's wrong with risk assessment um, and the political system, and I am happy to answer questions and really excited to see what you're going to do. Muchas gracias, uh, Jennifer. Can, you can uh, stop sharing the screen. Bueno, eh, excelente presentación, Jennifer. Thank you very much, Jennifer. You can stop sharing the screen. Excellent presentation. Very briefly, you've touched upon essential points. We have to remember that in many of our countries in Latin America, U.S. is presented as a model. We have to do what the U.S. is doing. Since the Green Revolution started there, we have to copy the model. And we have to use monocropping because that's part of the Green Revolution. We have to copy the USA. However, as you know, this is going through a crisis because of the scientific evidence and the uh, decision making. So this criticism that you've taken, that you've made to risk assessment is very important. And we've been working on this in other seminars regarding the precautionary principle and also the critical stance from Brazil. I cannot see any questions yet. I don't know why uh, people are not asking questions. To me, it seems very important to see this topic. If there are no more questions, perhaps you can delve more deeply into, in many of our countries, there's a struggle as a regulatory level to include the pre precautionary principle. This can accelerate decision-making and not be eternally in a paralysis because of analysis, i.e. to say that we need more and more studies when we have enough evidence. In your opinion, Jennifer, in your personal opinion, 
opinion, what advantages would there be to take on this precautionary principle in order to avoid these lengthy periods of wait? You said there were 15 years of litigations and 20 of advocacy and 30 of scientific evidence. We cannot repeat that in our context. Can you answer this question, please? Yeah, this is um, this is uh, something that I am now spending almost all my work time on is this weaponization of science, um, using science as a weapon for delay um, uh, to take action on hazardous materials. And this is uh, this is an, this is a huge um, global uh, government and industry um, initiative that's going on to develop they're always on the verge of developing some new tests that we have to wait for, some new sci science tests that, and um, enforcing these delays. And it, it's really, you know, very much weaponizing the science. And we're fighting that right now with the organophosphates. The, the excuse that EPA has said for delaying action is that it's waiting for more studies on new test methods that are these new non-animal NAMs, they're called non-animal or, or new alternative methods. These cells in a Petri dish fed into a model, a computer model, um, and we're arguing that we don't need any more science, that they should be um, evaluated as a group, not one at a time, and that they should be evaluated not on polynesterase, but they should be evaluated on the much more sensitive neurological effects of prenatally, but we have, I mean, this is this, this uh, science, scientists need to stand up and say, scientists need to say, we know, we, we know enough to know that it's past time to take action. Sí, efectivamente, este enfoque de clase, o sea, toda la clase de organofosforados, como puede ser toda la clase. Yes, this focus of the whole class of organoflores the classes that change of uh, chemicals that share a whole mechanism, it's a much more rational and much sounder rather than going chemical by chemical with this methodology of risk assessment, use by use, that makes decision making much lengthier. We think that at a level of the international conventions is very clear as in relation to other compounds. We have also before people ask more questions, we've placed on the chat a Google document so that those that are registered can fit it in with their names, organizations, and emails so we can give follow up to the interest they have shown. We can share the PowerPoints and also send other documents that we have. As I said, this is the first webinar. We will have another one with your guests from Europe. And also, this coalition work is very interesting. Uh, uh, last question, Jennifer. What does this coalition work imply? How important is it? And how can citizens participate also in this discussion, in this technical scientific uh, discussion? That will be. Yeah, that's one of the things I'm, I'm working really hard on is how to build power. Um, among impacted communities. So not having the science be something complicated and um, whereas the impacted communities, whether they be environmental justice communities, farm worker communities, urban communities um, that are, you know, that are more exposed to these chemicals uh, to, to sort of end, to really confront the myth that the science is too complicated and actually not just that but to draw a link between their knowledge and what the regulatory agencies understand because we don't right now we don't have that it's not a knowledge sharing and we need to i think we need to build power among the people that are most exposed because they understand the problem so well Uh, muy bien. Uh, Jennifer, ahí está en uh, Answers and Questions. Hay dos. Uh, Jennifer, in Questions and us, in Answers, there are two questions in English. I don't know if you can see them. Somebody says that you can't hear. Check your connection. You have to perhaps leave and, and re enter because everybody else can listen well. Can you read the questions, Jennifer? Can you see them? Okay, you can, you can answer both if you, if you like. You're, you're muted. Um, 
It's a good question. So the first one is if all the um, studies are in the US, then they're not really taking into account the unique uh, diversity of populations outside of the US. And I, I do think that that's true, that we need to, especially when it comes to um, most impacted. And we saw that when the IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, as part of the World Health Organization, when they evaluated glyphosate, Monsanto's product, uh, they what was the turning point for glyphosate um, was studies in other countries in um, uh, Latin America and Asia, where there was uh, high exposures of non-farm worker populations where they saw DNA damage in people living near fields had DNA damage and cancer risk. And that was a turning point for the, uh, for the World Health Organization's decision. So, I mean, having those studies is, is really important. Um, and someone said, what would be a better biomarker? I, I, I would actually defer, I don't know. I'm, I, 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 would, I, th I would defer to the scientists that are doing that kind of work. Um, but I will just say that for the neurological impacts, there isn't a good biomarker uh, of, of exposure. It's, that's, it's like lead and mercury and all these other heavy metals that we work with. Um, it, the effects on neural behavior and neural function, like IQ and learning and memory are too subtle to be measured, but I, I would say, and I'm not alone, that when it comes to a neurotoxic chemical, there's no safe level. When we've looked at lead or mercury, there's no safe level when it's exposure during pregnancy, during early life development. And we, I think the regulatory agencies as a precautionary principle should just apply to all, if you know it's neurotoxic, there's no safe level.